good afternoon everybody uh, it's a pleasure to be here for pic atta uh, for this particular month uh, and it's nice that we have a, a physical mode as well as an online mode parallelly going on so i'm sure that even though the audience we have a limited audience here i'm sure that there are many people who are attending this particular talk uh, online as well uh also for the members who are here uh, let me tell this also that uh, this particular link is being shared uh, later on as well uh, on the pic uh, website and it will be always available uh, for anybody to see the lecture even after the online session is over so welcome everybody to the pic platform and pic atta in particular uh, everybody here knows pune international center it's a it's a very good think tank of pune which works on very similar lines as india international center uh, we have lot of programs which continuously go on on pic platform uh, they are related to different conferences different seminars lectures debates cultural programs and so on and so forth we have a big program also on social innovation uh, also on defense strategies uh, and energy environment and there are many other things which of course you can see on the pic website uh pic atta is one such vertical where we call eminent uh, speakers from different parts uh, of the of the science technology and also in terms of arts and culture these are accomplished people uh, who come to us and share their views on uh, uh, the atta platform so today we are very fortunate to have with us a padmashri awardee uh, dr anil rajavanshi uh, he is a very noted scientist He's a pioneer, uh, and he has done good amount of work, huge amount of work on rural development uh, for last three decades, and he has spanned the whole spectrum of areas affecting the lives of rural population. Uh, renewable energy based cooking and lighting, power generation from agricultural residues, renewable fuel production from agriculture, electric cycle rickshaws, uh, water purification, effluent treatment through use of renewable energy. Uh, these have been his areas these areas are very very important in indian indian context so we all are not surprised sir that he is decorated with padma shri award um, he was the first person to promote the use of high technology for rural development an idea that is in vogue uh, these days uh, he has been raised uh, and born in lucknow dr rajavanshi he has uh, studied in united states to for his higher education he studied at university of florida following his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from iit kanpur he has received his phd in 1979 and later on he moved to university of florida for two and a half years and he did some work on young men of his age and education which is normally not done so we know that as we think of an iit alumni and uh, having done his uh, further studies in a university in the us normally we do find these people in some big big fat companies and having fat salaries and things like that but he has not done that he came back and he moved to fulton and he did lot of work on rural development main achievements uh, i will just quickly tell you uh, he is a principal author of national policy on energy self sufficient taluka which is being managed by mnre uh, he has pioneered the development of electric rickshaws in the 1990s this is something which is nowadays talked about but he has done it in 1990s itself he is the first person to initiate a program on e-rickshaw in the country uh, he developed unique program of improving cooking and lighting lighting technology for rural areas uh, he has done work on nuri lantern multi fuel land stove and the whole issue of rural lighting and cooking technology strategy uh, he has been a uh, pioneer he has pioneered in late 1990s the concept of using ethanol as a cooking gas and lighting fuel uh, and now we have this particular material also used in uh, hybrid uh, uh, locomotives and um, uh, 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 locomotives or you can say the automobiles uh, but he has done this uh, late back uh, uh, a few decades back for rural area in early 1990s his group at nari Uh, set up world's largest uh, program on production of ethanol from sweet uh, sorghum uh, he and his group has pioneered on use biogas gasification system this work also has he has done in nari valley works as a director of nari 
is pioneered the development of low cost solar based water purifiers and solar powered petal collectors of safflar is pioneered the development of a small rural snt institute uh, working on short string budget and pioneering technologies for rural areas he has been a recipient of lot of awards and he has have he has written multiple books uh, on varied topics so the awards are jamnalal bajaj award he has received in 2001 uh, from dr manmohan singh in 1998 he is um, he became the second indian to be inducted in us based solar hall of fame uh, his efforts led to nari getting uh, fiki platinum jubilee award in 2002 from prime minister shri atal bihari vajpayee His work on ethanol land stove was given 2009's Global Globe Forum Award for his sustainability <coughs> research in Stockholm uh, from the HRH Crown Princess of Victoria. In 2014, he became the first Indian to receive Distinguished Alumnus Award of University of Florida, USA, and in 2022, he has received Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Kanpur. This is what he also recently shared with us uh, in the morning today. In 2022, Government of India honored him with one of the highest civilian award, Padma Shri. He has delivered prestigious lectures uh, in different renowned forums of our country, um, and uh, in the Government of India committees, he is uh, representing like Planning Commission, Advisory Board of uh, MNRE, MERC, and so on. He is also a member of Jamnalal Bajaj Awards Committee. he has more than 250 publications uh, to his credit in international and national journals seven patents and written five books and various chapters in books in 2014 he wrote on human interest story of his work on renewable energy at nari and he has made book book this book freely available uh, in the uh, in the hope of inspiring youngsters to work on rural development in 2016 he published his autobiography and in 2019 his latest book exploring the mind of god how technology guided by spirituality can produce happiness this is exactly the topic of his today's talk both both these books are freely available on the net and we also have a stall outside uh, where one can take uh, the book we can one can see the book and also purchase the book he has lectured uh, and given keynote addresses in many universities in us and india He regularly gives inspirational lectures to large number of students at uh, prestigious institutes like IITs, NITs, and so on. Uh, besides the technolo technology work, uh, he has great interest in spirituality and holistic development, which is exhibited by the books that he has wrote and his various writings. He lives a simple life uh, in rural Maharashtra. It's very nice, sir, to have you here, and it's a pleasure uh, for PIC uh, to have you on this platform. I request you now. Thank you, Dr. Kade, for this long introduction. I am delighted to be here. I was expecting a lot of my classmates from IIT to come. Somehow they got stuck in the Saturday traffic. traffic. They told me that they are just coming, so probably they will uh, come any time. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank my friend Abhay. Vedya and Shri Kelkar, who initiated this whole process of inviting me for to talk on my book, and uh, I hope some of you read. It is already in the market, uh, and uh, I will give a small talk. But more than the talk, I think the most important thing are the question answers, and I would like to have sharp questions because I think is the question answers which. Really clarify a lot of things. So I am not going to have very. You, know, PIC was very kind to give me uh, 45 minutes, but I think I'll, I. Therefore, let me start. I am delighted to be here and thank the organizers, the PIC, for inviting me. I must also thank my book publishers, Story Mirror of Mumbai, Mr. Hitesh Jain is here, for publishing this book. There are lot, quite a number of copies and. I'll be delighted to sign the purchase copies. Dr. Kade gave a long uh, description of my work in renewable energy, and as they say that when you become zero, as I have become, then you become stop working on physics and you stop start working on metaphysics. 
this is what I do nowadays because all my previous avatar of technology, etc., is was done in 1980s and 1990s. This book is a distillation of all my writings on spirituality, technology, and sustainability that I've been writing on these subjects for the last 20 years. Please come. The theme of the book also reflects my personal spiritual and sustainable living journey. I believe all books are autobiographical in nature and this is no different. And I will talk about it later on. I will first talk about sustainable living. World is going through tremendous crisis. On one hand, it must cope with ever increasing pandemics like COVID, flu, HIV, etc. And on the other hand, the earth warming trend is creating large scale climate catastrophes with unseasonal heavy rains, flash flooding, heat waves, large scale forest fires, etc. Yesterday, heavy rain in Pune. On 15th, I was giving the institute lecture in IIT Kanpur. It rained like Mumbai. They had never seen so, many, so much rain. It flooded the whole of Lucknow. So these are strange phenomena which are taking place. I believe that both these issues have created an element of fear and have played havoc with the general well-being and happiness of mankind. They are also an outcome of our unsustainable lifestyle. Sustainable living and happiness should start with each one of us and we can make them as central issues in our life as Gandhiji said, when, then we can make this world a better place for future generations. Tomorrow is going to be Gandhiji's centenary, birth centenary, and I think we should really uh, take a pledge that we would like to live a sustainable life to make this world a very nice place to live. I believe that both happiness and sustainable living can be achieved by spirituality and judicious use of technology and thus happiness, sustainable living, and technology are related to spirituality. This is my thesis and a constant theme throughout the book. And this book is all about that. So how does this pan out? We'll first talk about happiness because we all strive to achieve and maximize it in our lives. We all work towards happiness. People have different definitions of happiness, but we all strive for happiness. So happiness is a state of mind. We feel happy and enjoy life through our senses and mind. Brain processes the information from the senses and our level of happiness is dictated by its processing power. A powerful brain, which is called the processor, which produces a deep thought can therefore extract more information from the sensory signals and can give us more happiness since the mind gets satisfied easily and we look at all the eventualities. A smaller processor obviously needs many more inputs to reach the same enjoyment or satisfaction level. Thus weaker brains need more resources to occupy them and this leads to greed and unsustainable lifestyle. And this is the basis of unsustainability and the whole process of corruption. Therefore, one of the prerequisites for happiness and to having a sustainable lifestyle development of a very powerful and smart brain. Such a brain allows us to think deeply or concentrate during which we can get lost in processing that information. I am sure all of us have done this that we, when we are so seized with a certain problem, the time stops, everything else vanishes and the focus becomes to solving the problem. A powerful brain or a processor also changes the priorities in life and helps in focusing on getting personal happiness through mental peace rather than material needs. When concentration on a single thought is carried out regularly and continuously for a long time, it takes our mind away from our insecurities and hence gives us a feeling of calmness and well-being. I have experienced this sometimes. I am sure some of you have also experienced it. And it's something to really look forward to. This deep thinking leads to spirituality. 
Spirituality is concerned with the matters of spirit. When we think deeply and for a long time, it is not something uh, out of, you know, as a lot of these uh, so-called gurus talk about um, uh, Nambo Jumbo. Spirituality is just deep thinking. When we think deeply and for a long time about everything, anything, whether it is an idea or an object, then the brain tends to focus it on a, like a laser and in that process the object vanishes from the field of vision and only its germ or the spirit remains. This process is called Sayyam in Patanjali Yoga Darshan. This results in complete knowledge of that idea or the object. This is a mechanism by which all great discoveries have been made. I have been very lucky to have met with some of the leaders of technology in the world. The father of hydrogen bomb was my colleague and my friend Stanley Olam, who was also a very close friend of Fermi and the person responsible in the Manhattan Project. And I used to discuss with him what is the process of creation, what is the process of creativity. And all of them said it is this deep thinking on the on the object or a subject which just makes you think about it in nothing else. I in fact had a great discussion with him once. I said, you are all great scientists, great uh, mathematicians. So I said, why did you do this uh, atom bomb thing? So he says, atom bomb was never in the picture. It was the solution of the problem. That was the, solution. That was the main thing. Atom bomb came as a byproduct. So all these people, with extreme, extremely deep thought, deep thinking, they created something wonderful. Spirituality is not religion. It is the state of mind that makes it understand that the truth is beyond the barriers of worldliness, religion, caste, creed, race or geographical frontiers. It connects us to the marvels of the nature in a deep way and subsequently to universal <coughs> conscious or the mind of God. Spirituality also helps us to have a compassionate view of nature and as we evolve spiritually, we become more tuned to it, which helps us in preserving it. Besides, it gives us a sense of connection to other living beings and this helps us to live in harmony with each other, enabling everybody to work together for common good. This is the genesis of non-violence and sustainable living. And I believe that Gandhiji was a very spiritual human being. He did this and this is what it led him to be very non-violent and a very sustainable human being. And I think if you all follow this type of um, things that he did, then I think we can make this country a great country. And now we'll talk about technology. Our technology, our civilization is defined by technology. In fact, we are here because of technology. I came in car from Fulton, he is taking a photograph it has been recorded, everything is a part of technology. Everything that we do in this world is because of technology. It touches every aspect of our life. Yet we sometimes become slaves of technology and do not have the wisdom to use it judiciously and efficiently. Technology is a double-edged sword. We can use it to help mankind improve the quality of life, but it can be used to destroy mankind by wars and unsustainable development, as what is happening today. Spirituality gives us wisdom and helps us to curb our greed for resources and this thus can guide us to use the technology so efficiently. And this is the central theme of my book, that we need to have technology. We cannot get away from technology. We are going to become a very technologically advanced society, but we need to use technology very judiciously with the help of wisdom that we will get from spirituality. I also feel that there is a law of evolution that as we evolve spiritually, we will also become a very highly technologically advanced civilization. It's not the other way around. So you have to become spiritually evolved to become technologically advanced civilization. This is because when we apply our sharpened brains to any problem, then solutions occur to us. And I feel that this is the way we are progressing and hopefully if we don't destroy uh, each other, then we will ultimately reach a uh, collective traveling civilization. Technology helps us in making our lives easy and better 
and hence leads to partial happiness. The full happiness comes only when we make our mind powerful through focused thought and hence become spiritual. Thus, technology guided by spirituality produces happiness and sustainability. The main thesis of the book. Why this book? I started writing about these issues almost 20 years ago. In fact, my first article on this, when I started writing for a speaking tree in Times of India, was on this, how technology and spirituality are together. This was a very, very new thing, novel idea. Now, everybody who's who in spirituality talks about spirituality, science, technology. So this is something that people just, uh, catch up. Most of these articles were published in speaking tree column of Times of India, in Huffington Post, Thrive Global, South Asia Monitor, and a as a syndicated articles in various news lines, papers, etc. In fact, Abhay Vedya took carried a lot of these articles in his uh, uh, what is it called Sparrow, the Golden Sparrow. Almost every week, a new an article was carried by him. Some of these articles were also published in 2004 in my first book entitled Nature of Human Thought. Since then, I have published many more articles on this subject. They were all standalone articles and were well received by the readers. Hence, I thought of putting most of them together in one place. This book is an outcome of the desire and is a sequel to my earlier book, Nature of Human Thought. So what does this book contain? There are three sections of the book. The first section has 33 essays on how to make the mind powerful so that the inner peace results. Because unless you see the world according to how your mind is, if your mind is very um, uh, confused, very um, uh, not very stable, too much anger, you look at the world accordingly. So it's the mind which has to be produced, a powerful mind at peace with itself, then start looking at things very differently. A happy and contented mind then sees the world accordingly. This section contains four parts, all focusing on how to create inner peace. The first part defines and talks about the basic theme of the book, happiness, and deals with the issues of what is happiness and how to achieve it. I was very arrogant and I wrote an article called Science and Art of Happiness. And later on I found out that the Lai Lama had also written that <laughs> type of article. So I felt very happy that I was on the right path. Happiness is a state of mind and thus a powerful mind is capable of producing, creating happiness. The second part therefore contains essays showing how to create a powerful mind through meditation. Specifically, what is the neurobiological basis of meditation, how to do it and what are, what are its attributes. I am an engineer by profession. And I have always believed that engineering is a training of the mind. You become an engineer, you are taught the philosophy that you can take any problem, spend some time on it, make it to small parts and then you can solve it. And so I started looking at the spirituality and the brain research in the same manner. I am not a brain scientist but I think I can read very deep papers on brain and I can assimilate part of it. And so I have now tried to put together what our ancient scriptures like Patanjali Yoga talked about brain because Patanjali Yoga is the first book, the first book on really the science of mind control. It does not have, it has nothing to do with God or anything else. It is purely a book on science, on the mind control. So I have been very inspired by that Patanjali Yoga and I try to see what are the different sutras which match what we know of brain from the modern science technology. Because you see the leap of faith is fine, but it should follow the percepts of science. Science cannot be uh, left behind. When we, when some people talk about very funny things, the quantum mechanics and the soul and etc. That is a very, they were going on a very thin line. We need to look at some of these old things, but they should follow the percepts of science and they should really come to some understanding on how the world is made of and what exactly happens. So this has been my aim in writing this book and my articles that how we can use the modern brain research 
and try to correlate and I found some very very fascinating things and the, I just looked at the tip of the iceberg it is an infinite ocean. Development of a powerful mind is also helped through the resolution of conflicts. So when you start looking at the, how the brain works then there are psychological knots, how they are formed, what are the neural pathways and so I started looking at the, those things and the conflicts are caused by the psychological knots produced by emotions. The third part of this section contains essays about the nature of emotions, their neurobiological origins and the resolution. And this is a very fascinating area. And I thought that, you know, I have the great satisfaction and also the freedom of do whatever I feel like. Nobody tells me you have to work only in um, uh, rural development, you have to work in lanterns or etc. I can do anything. And this has been a very uh, happy coincidence that a small institute that I run, I have uh, total freedom so I can look at all the avenues. And I don't go anywhere. So say, living in a small rural place, thinking, writing and contemplating is a very, very satisfying thing. And the final part of the section deals with the attributes of a healthy body. A healthy body supports a powerful mind. Thus the essays in this part talk about the attributes of a healthy body and how to achieve it through exercise, good sleep and through the use of alternative medicines. I am an amateur homeopathy doctor and I started looking very deeply into how homeopathy works. And there are some very innovative and very interesting things that I came with and so this is a part of that. And the last article in this section is about my spiritual experiences which have guided me on the path of spirituality and provided the inspiration to write this book. The section 2 has 16 essays on how to improve the environment through technology so it becomes livable and sustainable. No matter how contented the mind is, its power is enhanced many times if it encounters a pleasant, healthy and sustainable environment. I give lectures in IITs and other colleges and institutes and I always ask them how many of you will go abroad and a large number of people raise their hands and I ask them why and they say the quality of life, the quality of working condition, the environment is what makes them run away from this country and I always ask them can't you make this country great because you are the future and I think it is the environment which really is what is, helps you in doing a lot of things. I have always wondered why the great spiritual thought came in this country. Why not in any other country? And I feel that this country was a very, very beautiful country as Abhay used to say, uh, Golden Sparrow. The, this country was very, very endowed with tremendous greenery, lot of things available. So the old rishis, their stomach was full and then they focus on the higher thought. Ask yourself, how will you create conditions by which you can focus on higher thought or create a higher thought? And that is the process of starting a very nice environment around you. You don't have to change the whole country, you don't have to change everything else. Just change your environment so that you can focus on a thought and you can think about higher things rather than the mundane and the fighting. I believe that we will all be born again and again on this planet Earth and feel that it will be beneficial for all of us to make it livable and pleasant so that it ultimately becomes heaven. And that is the basis on how, why we should use the technology for sustainability. All life forms want a comfortable and happy life. In case of human beings, it is a sum of two things, personal happiness and environmental happiness. Personal happiness can be obtained from the variety of ways. Basically, one becomes happy when one is contented or at peace with oneself. And this we have covered in the section 1. Environmental happiness is what I call community or nation building. We don't build nations by uh, concrete or anything else. We build nation because we can create a very happy and livable environment. It is the enabling environment that makes you feel happy to live in, work in and just be a part of it. 
Thus, environmental happiness also gives us a sense of belonging and ownership and makes us feel proud of our surroundings. If we create a happy environment in our workplace and homes, then we will make this country a great place to live in. Each one of us should therefore work towards improving our immediate environment so that it becomes lively and cheerful. Our work at NARI, and now I will come to the uh, work that uh, Sangeeta talked about, regarding rural and sustainable development reflects this theme and written up in this section. Thus our work on tree plantation and their benefits, water conservation, efficient rainwater harvesting and its purification through solar energy, how to provide nutritious food to rural poor, how to help farmers increase their revolutions through high-tech farming, etc. are some of the essays in this section. Because if we create an enabling environment, then we can take everybody together and create a very nice society. This section also shows how each one of us can contribute to becoming sustainable in our lives so that we can make the environment pleasant and livable. Sustainable lifestyle can also reduce future pandemics. And the last essay is on our small experiment of living sustainability in Fulton, where I have shown that in one-fourth to one-fifth the energy consumption of an average American, I live a very decent, modern and fulfilling life. I have been a, a great admirer um, of Gandhiji and Gandhiji said, whatever you want to preach, you should practice it. And I think I am doing it, but much, much on a lower scale than what he did. And so we have shown that how you can live a very sustainable life in much less energy. And now I come to the last section of my book. The last section contains 16 books, 16 essays about exploring space. The last frontier which I can believe can help in joining the individual with the universal consciousness. A powerful and peaceful mind becomes a great instrument of imagination and daydreaming. This section details the yearning of the mind which wants to increase its experiences and knowledge and leads to tremendous curiosity and desire to explore the next frontier, which is death and space. One of the inherent curiosities in humans is what is about what happens to us after death. That's a final exit. Do we stay here on this planet Earth or go into space? What happens to our memories after death? How do we get out of the gravity field of this Earth? Nature of extraterrestrials does the interaction of thought with gravity helps in this process, etc., etc. These speculative issues are explored in the essays in this section. And mind you, these are all speculative. But I have tried to be as close to the science because science is the ultimate thing that will tell you whether you are totally an idiot, a nincompoop, or you talk some sense because some things have not been discovered. So the casualty of science has to be used in all these matters. These speculative issues are explored in these essays and I feel their inquiry and study may help in producing a mechanism by, by which an individual could be connected to universal consciousness and help in understanding the mind of God. I also believe that the ultimate aim of mankind is to become a galaxy traveling civilization. In ancient times, there were gods who came from heaven but with the advancement of technology guided by spirituality, we will all ultimately become gods. I believe in that. I believe that we will all progress, progress towards that evolution where we will be intergalactic traveling civilization and we will all become gods because gods are nothing else but people who possess tremendous technology, materials, etc. And now I come to my last section about my personal spiritual journey because all books are autobiographical in nature. And whatever I have written is from my own experiences. So I like to share with you my... This book also reflects my personal spiritual journey. My spiritual journey started at the age of 13. I have written about it in some detail in section 1. And I hope you can read it. The initial journey was about self-discovery and training of the mind through meditation which led to get, getting some interesting spiritual experiences. My father went to jail with Gandhiji in 1942 and uh, 
I was born two and a half years after Gandhi's death, so I never saw him in flesh and blood. And at the age of my, on my 13th birthday, my father gave me the present of a Hindi translation of Gandhiji's experimental truth. And it changed my life. I used to be, you always come first and second in my school, and I just could not put that um, book down. It's not that I understood everything, but the first initial years of Gandhiji's life had a tremendous profound influence. And then it led to my starting the yearning for reading spiritual books of India, the great spiritual traditions. At the age of 14, how much you can uh, imbibe. But there was a great genuine and a desire to do that. And that is how it started, the whole spiritual journey. So whatever I have written is based upon my own thinking and uh, my own experiences. As the mind became strong and powerful, the yearning for experience and knowledge started. This was the mind expanding phase which was also helped by my education as an engineer and especially solar engineer. Engineering opened new vistas and expanded my vision field. The learning of solar energy principles is engineering and related developments in the United States gave me the knowledge about the environment and instilled in me the love of nature. After I came back to India from the United States in 1981, I continued this journey of exploration and improving my immediate environment through my technology work in NAR. This in turn made me look at my spiritual yearnings in a new light. <clears throat> During the US days, as my mind expanded with new experiences and information, it started on the journey of learning about space, gravitation and stars. I felt it was a natural progression of a curious and powerful brain. In fact, I became so interested in the whole matters of gravitation, space travel, and naturally I had the great satisfaction of knowing the father of the modern rocketry, Von Braun. Von Braun was a very close friend of my professor. My professor got uh, NASA's highest award for the Saturn V rocket design. So I had the great satisfaction of meeting him. So I just got so much interested in the space and I felt that we will ultimately become a civilization in the future which uh, travels through intergalactic uh, things. And in fact, I almost went to do my PhD in physics rather than mechanical engineering because I became so interested in gravitation and other things. Thus, what I have written in this book reflects my personal journey in the matters of spirituality, technology, happiness, and understanding the laws of marvelous nature and universe or the mind of God. When I wrote this book, the title of the book is Exploring the Mind of God. And you know, the moment you write God, it has different connotations. I wanted to convey knowing or try exploring the mind of consciousness or this beautiful nature, but that was becoming very big. So I said, let me put this God and let the readers decide whether this was the appropriate title or not. But ultimately, it is this marvelous nature which to my mind is God and which is what Einstein believed in. Einstein did not believe in all of the personal gods believed in this God, which is a huge, fantastic nature. The theme, so, in a sense, this book is about exploring the larger issues of life and cosmos, aided by spirituality and technology. This theme also mirrors that of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. I have been inspired by his spirit and the similarity, similar, similarity between this book and his Yoga Sutras might have been an outcome of their influence. This book is also about my desire to understand the world around me and to make head or tail of it. With my limited efforts, I have experienced joy in making some headway and hence thought of sharing it with my readers. I hope this book also inspires some bright and dedicated young students who want to do things differently and where the focus is not money but leading a fulfilling and happy life as I have done. This book is slightly difficult reading, but I am sure such students will be challenged by it. Finally, I hope you will all enjoy reading this book and will be delighted to get your feedback of where have I gone wrong and what can we improve. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very uh, nice talk and uh, taking us through the journey 
of uh, what what you have done uh, till now and how is it connected to the technology the happiness that we achieve and what are the ways in which our country needs an improvement in terms of energy environment and uh, other issues which are related to the outer space as well so thank you for uh, for covering a, a nice canvas of uh, the things that one needs to know as a human being so now i invite uh, the uh, the question and answers uh, uh, let us take the questions I just wanted to know, Limay, as a scientist, uh, what is your viewpoint on soul and reincarnation? Well, I've, I've written in this book. Uh, I don't know the, what the soul is. There are certain speculations. I consider this as a memory or a passage of some information. If I come to know about what the soul is. Maybe I'll come in a different incarnation back to you, because you know these these matters. You know it's very interesting. When I I still uh, write a lot on uh, death and reincarnation, and the funny part is nobody, at least the knowledge that I have, nobody ever talked about what happens after death. Any time, even Gautam Buddha, when people went to him, he said, "Live a good life." There was a very fantastic description of uh, Bhishma Pitamaya with uh, Yudhishthir, and he asked this question: "Let listen. All what you have done is it totally useless if after death all the memories and everything goes?" He never answered. Give a good life. I think nobody really knows, but I believe that science and the leap of faith. Provides us just like Einstein's gravitation, which was a leap of faith. Nobody had thought you know, these things exist. It was Einstein who discovered. He did not find find it. It was uh, these things exist. I believe that this could be because we have not understood a lot of things about. You know, I do not know. You are a scientist. The last interview of Einstein that he gave to Scientific American, he, Einstein was the Star, the initiator of the photon. He was the one who invented photon, and he said, "You know, I don't understand what photon is, and yet everybody believes in photon." So this is a very fascinating thing. I have looked little deeper into this with whatever is available, and I still don't understand how photon travels through space. What exactly? You know, the Einstein's whole thought experiment started. When he said it, if I sit on the photon, how will I perceive the world? And all his relativity theory came from that. And that equation, that system still exists. We still do not understand. So all these things probably could be looked at from that point of view. The casualty has to be science, or even if the leap of faith has to come, it has to be based upon this. That somebody it should be able to explain all the different things. I have tried to explain in my article on death and reincarnation, but I think uh, unless and like get out of my body, I will not be able to tell you what death is. What is? Yeah. And we are all seekers of truth. We have never, you know, this whole tamasha that this country has, this guru is all total nonsense. We are all seekers of truth. Some people have looked little more deeper. That's all. So, uh, good afternoon, sir. So wonderful indeed is this work that you are thinking about. Uh, I got two small questions. One is uh, nowadays a new concept of. Can you introduce yourself? Well, I'm uh, Dr. Dattatre Tapkir. I'm a retired uh, uh, teacher educator, I'm a professor from Bihar College, okay. and I'm interested in the spiritual intelligence kind of thing. Okay. So my question was uh, nowadays new concept of spiritual intelligence is coming up. Just as logical intelligence, social intelligence, and Daniel Goldman's uh, emotional intelligence. So, do you think this is a, a proper track to enter into spirituality rather than entering from so-called fanatic religious uh, uh, egoism? Uh, go through scientifically and enter into the spiritual intelligence. So, would be there really some kind of intelligence like this? Spiritual intelligence. See, intelligence is intelligence. Yeah. You can put all different labels to it. Yeah. Intelligence means that your brain becomes so powerful yes. that you can take a look at any problem 
Yeah, an infinite solution. So whether you call it spiritual intelligence, emotional intelligence, or whatever it is, this is the labels. I see. Intelligence is the ultimate thing. So that is that way. Because you see what happens that we create a lot of problems by labeling. Nature is never labeled. Uh -huh. Nature is all and capacity. Fine, fine. You should yeah. look at that. Right, right. So another small question would be, uh, you said, sir, uh, uh, spirituality is deep thinking. It's quite fine, at, uh, at least at the initial stages. But as we progress in the uh, uh, spiritual progress as such, but don't you think that when we turn, this is okay, concentration or dharana for deep thinking. But our goal has to be go beyond thinking and become nirvichar in real meditation or real spirituality. See, when you start looking at something very deeply, yeah, it automatically happens because uh -huh. you, you lose the track of what the thing was, the, the, the germ remains. Yes. And that is what it is. Uh -huh. Whether you call it nirvichar or sarvichar or whatever it is. Okay, uh -huh. but it has to go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sunit Shah. I uh, just want two small questions. One is, what is your definition of consciousness? Uh, scientifically looking and spiritually looking, what is consciousness? And secondly, uh, do you think that all of us are connected through this cosmic consciousness? We don't understand about what what is consciousness. Amoeba has consciousness. I have written about this. I believe that we are all afraid of our forms being destroyed. When we become aware of our forms, that is consciousness. First thing that even the smallest of insect, you want to kill it, the first thing it runs away, tries to run away. The fear, because it wants to keep its form intact. And that is the basis of also the procreation and etc. So, I have written about this in the I just want to listen to let me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, we still do not understand, or people, you know, talk a little. The other thing I think is, when we have a concept of time, that is where the consciousness starts. So, atom will remain as atom for billions of years. It has no time embedded in that. There may be time. But only when it becomes aware of the time, it's when the molecules become big and when they start interacting with other things, then the time comes in. We still don't understand how the time gets into it. And that to my mind is when the consciousness starts. This is my understanding. No, I just want, one thing I want to add is how is consciousness created? That's, that was my question. The consciousness is created because world is, universe is, you and I are there, it's only because we have consciousness. Uh, the question is, what leads to this consciousness? What, what creates this consciousness, the, 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 scientifically and spiritually? You know, they, they're all same. You see, this, this, no, 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 the explanations are uh, The explanation is also same. After all, what is the DNA made of? Atoms? Molecules? Yeah. At a certain length. It becomes a living process. We still do not understand why that length. I have written about it that I think that it starts interacting with the gravitation field, then it becomes a living molecule, which means that a different planets with a different gravity will have it. But at the same time, I feel that there will be a time embedded in it, and I do not understand how time gets into it. So this is where the consciousness starts. Because if you go to the molecular level, you see after all atom, a photon which is made billions of years ago and a photon that you make in your lab, how would you differentiate? There's a very, very uh, fascinating uh, scientific uh, paradox. How do you find? Some, uh, some molecules degenerate, our cells degenerate, etc. That, that, there's a time to that. But what about these atoms? which are there forever. But when they become large molecules or DNA, then the consciousness comes in. Right. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, Dr. Prashant Khankoja. I'm also working in renewable energy. Uh, my question is, uh, when a person is uh, achieved something and he is a powerful, either by position or by money, 
uh, is he find difficult to uh, control his emotions because we see a lot of cases of suicidal attempts are actually suicide uh, with a great sports star or great uh, film star or something like that so is there any technological advantage available to them to uh, have emotional intelligence working on them because i don't know why they cannot do it because they have everything with them but they are not able to control emotions at a particular point of time and they su- commit suicide so what is that actual feeling at that point of time which succumb uh, them to death you have to ask them you have to ask them not not me no no i'm just saying so, yeah so secondly when you get lot of this money and power etc your insecurities also increase and this book is about how to reduce those insecurities through deep thought and when the deep when the insecurities the higher you uh, rise the more insecure you become that's why all those pudharis or the politicians they all go to this um uh, spiritual leaders so so called etc all the time dun dun and do so much dan i run a small institute i can i cannot get donations if you are able to give me donation i'll collect it today itself but if you if i set up a uh, mandir huge amount of donation will come this is a guilty feeling sir so this is all what happens so insecurities is what ultimately so just by the technology because they don't have the wisdom or the spirituality that we talking about to take the technology for yeah yeah good afternoon yes my question basic question i have uh, who, what is god people have so misconception about this so as per scientific or spiritual you see is understand i always consider this like a modern painting you see whatever you want to see that is what your definition some people have near death experiences they come back when they come back they tell you that i saw a tunnel going through a tunnel i had a very good feeling and at the end of the tunnel i had a light he says i have come back so what is it actually the brain uh, seeing something uh, or is it really something god god is i have written a lot on that in my book yeah. and uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of interesting things that happen in the brain we have uh, data on the waves that start happening gamma waves etc and uh, <clears throat> i through my thinking i have also looked very deeply in what is thought and thought is basically a um, output of the brain and this produces some photons and i think if you read in the book then you will get some ideas the experiences that the near death experience people have said these are real experiences based upon what you think because when you come back you have the language to tell what you experience what you experience may be something else but conversion of that experience into the language is what you talk about so it is possible that that experience may transcend the language but the only way you can tell about that experience is through the language that you have so there is a clouded by that language that is what you think about yes yeah so my question is <coughs> can you identify yourself my name is abhishek i run one organization kpo here in pune my question is that uh, this uh, shine sent technology you just talked about that spirituality is just about thinking very deeply but it also depends that on what you think if the object chosen by you is not a very fruitful object which we have to very deeply think of so can we say that it will lead to a spirituality for example like you talked about that technology and uh, the shines so we are thinking lots of we are giving lots of thinking on the shines and technology but can we say that this type of thinking is leading us towards the spirituality or somewhere this is a question mark is still we have to think on have you ever done meditation deep meditation yeah. you can start with samosa if you like samosa you can start with samosa and you will end up with a ultimate reality 
thinking deeply because you see we, we think that we think deeply 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes we have this whole process of thinking deeply is not for very short time is a continuous process and i have speculated in my book that when you do that your memories can also be removed and patanjali talks about removing sanskars sanskars are memories <laughs> and i have shown that yes it is possible because when the synapses are made broken etc it really starts removing your memories but that has to be very very deep thinking for a very long time and there are a lot of essays on that and if you read that you will uh, get no, an idea object matters or not yes object does not matter object matters initially but later on as the uh, thinking goes deeper the object vanishes the spirit remains yes and that is what it is but which way is better one A- anything object or anything and uh, ram krishna used to give a very nice example a boy young boy came to a guru that i want to uh, i want to understand what is god i want to see god he understood that this boy is very sharp but he did not know about all the other things so he said what do you love so he says my calf so he said focus on your calf So he focused for six months on calf. Then the uh, guru went, and this boy was uh, uh, crying. He, sir, I don't know what you have done because the boy was very smart, very very focused. He says the calf is from here to the sky. So he says you continue. So after six months again he went, and he again saw the boy crying. He says the calf is on my hand. He says you continue. And after a year or year and a half when he went, he said you, I, calf, everything is same. And this is universe and this is God. is a is a focus is the this the object becomes a mechanism to focus provided you can focus and think very deeply for a very long time that's what it is uh, yes sir thank you very much for this very interesting talk and insights now my question is that uh, technology today is guided by power and profits all over the world so what do you and it has been destructive as we can all see um we want to develop better and smarter weapons etc uh, now what do you mean by technology guided by spirituality can you give us some examples of that? you see the, the, this is a this is a ongoing process evolutionary process we developed uh, atom bomb uh because i knew some of the people who were the players in that development there was a tremendous strange psychosis of the brain at a time everybody was thought as a communist so they you know openheimer who was the father of hydrogen uh, atom bomb his security was removed because he was thought to be a communist or whatever it is the people who wanted to control see the whole world is based upon control everything we want to control so they thought that they had a weapon they can control everything <coughs> knowing very little that this technology this idea because idea in the world does not stay at one place this is the law of ideas because if you think of a great idea i will think at the nearly the same time in fact a lot of times when i have thought that you know i have got the fantastic idea i used to go into the united states to my library now i go to the internet and i have always found that somebody else has also thought it so this arrogance is immediately reduce but that also tells you that you are on the right path so the technology is there when you do not have the wisdom coming from spirituality you will use it we had a technology we almost came to annihilating the world by the atom bombs but somehow mankind survived because there were some senior elements in the nixon sorry in the kennedys and at the same time in khrushchev's cabinet who said no no we should not do that i think this will continue and this is my hope and belief that we are going to travel very rapidly in the evolution of technology but that will also tell us because the people who are developing these technologies are also deep thinkers somebody is just recently came up he google for the first time thinks that there is a sentient being which has come out from the computers and i had predicted it long time back because after all computers are 
huge crunching machines. Brain is also a crunching machine. And we may get some whatever is called consciousness, such big numbers may ultimately come out with some consciousness. But these things will continue. And I have hope and I have believed that we will have the wisdom from spirituality to control the technology. And then the technology will go even at a much faster rate for producing things for betterment of mankind. You will not destroy it. Because a lot of times it has happened. Even this uh, COVID is a part of that process, unsustainable lifestyle, etc. So this was a wake-up call. Very rapid changes took place, very rapid technological developments took place. But people also started thinking very deeply about their lifestyle. This has been a very, very positive outcome of COVID. People are not going back to the work. They say, why the hell were you working for 20 hours? We have enough money. So there is a very big crisis in developing country, developed countries where people are not going back to the work. So they are importing huge number of Indians. So large number of people, Indians are going to Australia, to here, there, everywhere. This is opening up for India. Have I answered your question? Uh, yes, yes. I know we have a lot of time, but I'm not, uh, I'm tempted to ask this question. Uh, in your short introduction at the back of this uh, book, uh, it says uh, in a field of madness and uh, arrogance, you left the uh, US and came to India and you have been working in renewable energy, solar energy and uh, sustainable development, rural development, etc. So working in the sector, according to you, uh, whatever I heard so far, is it just superficial? No, no, no. <laughs> See, uh, human, human endeavor is never superficial, at least in my case. I I use the same passion as I in developing Lantern in trying to understand what the human thought is. Same thing. I don't differentiate. So there's nothing superficial. Everything has to be done with a passion and with deep thinking. Okay, I think we will uh, we will enter the question answer session here. Thank you, uh, sir, for a extremely good talk and a very very good discussion forum. As I always say, PIC is a very good platform for good uh, give and take. Uh, it is very nice to get questions from the audience. The audience may be seeming to be less, but they are all very good. So let me thank the audience and of course, sir, for extremely good talk, sir. And uh, I'm sure that the book will be very, very interesting and it is just kept uh, outside for everybody to view and if you want to purchase, you can purchase. So before we end the talk, uh, this session, uh, just uh, let me tell you about the upcoming event of PIC. Uh, this is a public lecture on an economist's journey into the epics. The speaker is Dr. Bibek Debroy. He is a chairman, Economy Advisory Council to Prime Minister of India. Uh, the session will be chaired by Dr. Vijay Kelkar. This uh, event is coming up on 8th of October, uh, that is which is Saturday. And uh, the venue is Gokhale Institute uh, on BMCC Road. So kindly you know, take a note of this. You'll see this flyer also on PIC website. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir, for this very interesting session. Thank you.